Hi, everybody. Hi. Well, welcome to Google. Thanks. Thanks for being here. <laughs> it's nice to be here. So um, I wanted to start with your earlier um, acting career. Um, you were a part of a, a few uh, quite iconic cult hit movies uh, that became cult hits later on. And you know, you got Valley Girls and um, one of my personal favorites, uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Um, Daddy. So, <laughs> yes, Daddy. So um, I wanted to ask if you had any fond memories from those experiences that uh, you wanted to share. And did you expect these movies to become you know, this big? Um, good question. Um, you know, honestly, every time I would get a project, I never knew what was going to happen with it. Uh, never. Like, um, Pee Wee's Big Adventure was just a casting I went out for and then booked it. And all I remember was, I remember seeing, like, them talking about Tim Burton. And they were saying, oh, Tim's going to be this big director. And I remember watching him thinking, hmm, he's like a mad scientist genius and I remember walking on the set of Pee-wee's Big Adventure and there was all the cool like kitchen, the cooking things and the set. And I remember how detailed Tim Burton was. And I remember thinking, he's got something really special. And those are the kind of things that I, I take in a lot when I'm working is um, the people I'm working with. And, and a lot of the projects I did, they'd always say, um, I did this movie with um, Kevin Costner called Fandango. And it was right when Kevin Costner was just starting to break. It was... Um, his career, and they were saying, this guy's going to blow up. And I always remember wondering, like, I wonder how they know, like, how they knew that Tim Burton was going to blow up and how they knew that Kevin Costner was going to blow up. But um, those are the kind of things I remember on my projects. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and uh, how did you transition from that into voice acting? Well, voices... Um, I did a lot of voices when I was a little kid. You know, I would just, like, walk around the playground and be like, I don't like that very much. You know, I would just do these weird voices and let's go beat up Farshid at the water fountain. You know, we would just talk about, you know, we would do voices when I was little, but I didn't think anything of it. But, um, you know, then I did a play where um, I had to be a female wrestler in each round of the play. I was a different age, and then some guy had heard me do voices in this play, and he was like, you're really good with your voice. And I never thought anything about it, but it was this this thing that I never I never thought anything about, and, and he said, you should audition for some things. And so it was one of those things that just kind of dropped into my life, and I went out for this one audition for a cartoon, and it was to do the voice for this little character, and I was like, hmm, that sort of sounds like the voice I've been doing my whole life since I was a little girl, like, you know, and this character had, like, big floppy lips and a round head. And so I just sort of started doing, oh, you know, Jackie, I'm not sure I like that. And then I auditioned for that. And then I booked Tommy Pickles. I remember what your question was originally, but that's where I landed. Yeah, no. no, yeah, that's, 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 what I actually was just about to ask I you read about your mind, the yeah. legendary Tommy Pickles. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming some of you here, like me, grew up in the 90s and, uh, we're Nickelodeon fans, and I love Rockrats. Yay. Um, it was very, very cool. I, I hear there is a reboot coming back. It's, yeah, it's there's, um, there's, there's been a reboot, a feature film, and a, I think 26 new episodes, which would be amazing. I can't say more than that, but I'm, I'm really But you're going to be on it, right? Well, I can't say more oh, okay. than that, <laughs> but I would say that I'm really excited about okay. it. You know, um, Rugrats is like... It's a family. Yeah. It's a family that we grew up at. And I always think, like, everybody wants to feel cozy and safe. Like, especially today, it's raining. But everyone wants to feel a cozy safety. And I really think, like, Rugrats brought that family thing to, to people's homes. And they that's why everybody loves it. It's because the moms loved it. The dads loved it. The kids loved it. And now the generations are loving it because it was family. It was, like, this cozy thing. And for them to bring back their family, people are really excited. Like, I get to be cozy again in the family. Yeah, it's good. Bringing happiness to lots of people. Yay. So how did you come up with the voice? Did you have some form of, you know, direction from the people working on it? Did you just kind of start playing around or? Um, you know, like I said, the, the, the audition was, um, it was my first audition I'd ever been on for an animated show. And I had done movies my whole life and I had done singing my whole life. So I knew how to play with my voice. But when they showed me this claymation, I just was like, 
I think that's what my God gift is, is that my ability to see a mouth and know what sound is going to come out of that mouth. Like, and I always tell everyone, like, if I were to put all of you guys um, in a row and then you were to play me all of your guys' voices all over the place, like not in order, that I would probably be able to pick the voice that goes with the mouth. And I think that's wow. what my weird, it's a very strange gift. <laughs> like, it's really strange. But I think my first instinct on Tommy Pickles when I saw the little claymation was, I'm not sure. You know, he was so kind of innocent and sweet and very much baby. And that was the first voice that came out of my mouth and my first voice audition ever for a cartoon. And then I just booked it and I didn't know what I was doing. It was not in my wheelhouse to do animation. That's great. Yeah. Um, so uh, I saw a video of you giving voice tips, like voice acting tips. And there was a, a really cool uh, thing that she did where for like teeth chattering, I guess you put like a pen between your teeth. A you pen know, like, or a pencil. Yeah, yeah. like what, what, like, could Wish you, you have, had a pen or pencil. Do you guys have a pen? <laughs> Anybody has a pencil? Uh, um, I will. Do you, do you, it's, do you have any other tips like that, that, um, that you use or that you think are fun for people that want to get into it? Yeah. Well, first of all, I do have a voiceover seminar that I did for a live audience and it's a digital download on egdaily.com. But, um, and I did that because a lot of people were asking like, do you have any tips and tools for voiceover? And, you know, the basics and stuff. But there's so many weird tools. Like if you go to a voice session, you'll see people do things like, you know, they, they pull their lip out or they, they play their, you know, they miss with their cheek or, you know, um, SpongeBob does. That's how he gets that sound. I can't do it that fast, but he does it really fast. There it is. Anyway, that's um, SpongeBob. Don't tell him I told you his secret. But And the pencil teeth chattering is you basically just, um, take a pencil or pen and you put it near your teeth and you just go like this and it makes a like a shivering cold cartoon sound. So, I mean, there's a million tips like that. There's like, if you're doing a British accent, you talk like this. And then if you leave your tongue on the tip of your mouth, you start to talk a little bit more on the, um, uh, the Indian side. It sort of, sort of brings out the Indian inside of it's, a, I'm not doing very well myself right now, but, um, it's a really, there's so many little tools and tips and, a lot of the time it's playing with your mouth, you know, to create braces. You might put your um, finger in your mouth and sort of talk like this. So Susie has braces and she spits all over herself. You know, so that's a kid with braces. But And there's a lot of tips. And it's not very sexy, but <laughs> that's what I get paid for. It may not look sexy, but it sounds awesome. I feel sexy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would like to talk about the T-shirt that I'm wearing. Um, yeah, I love your T-shirt. But I just have one question. Why is Buttercup on the bottom? Yes. <laughs> We're good here, you guys. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I am very happy now. <laughs> um, so Buttercup was my favorite. I grew up as a very feisty teenager, and um, I related to this kindergarten girl. <laughs> uh, so out of the three, she was obviously the feistiest one. Um, what has it been like to be part of a show that has inspired so many girls, you know, to to kind of find their, their power and the, and their voice and... Um, you know, and has she also been kind of an outlet for stress or rage <laughs> when you're... Yes, she <laughs> is! Um, Buttercup is like, um, I think of the three, she's the feistiest, obviously. And I think, um, I just think there's nothing cooler than little, tiny, petite little girls with um, superpowers. And superpowers to save the day or help people that are uh, not doing well. And I think it just takes, I love that it takes away that you have to be huge or you have to be, you know, super muscular, you know, that it's just, um, you know, wanting to make life, the world better is the Powerpuff Girls, you know, and they're little and they're petite and they're little girls, but they still are all about making the planet better. So what an incredible message for everyone right now, you know, especially now and there's, um, things have changed so much, like with the Me Too movement and stuff. I just think it's really incredible to have, and, and the other thing I always say I love about the Powerpuff Girls is that they work as a team. And I really think that I know my life goes better when I work as a team. Like, I try not to make a lot of decisions without my tribe. And the Powerpuff Girls are so good because they're so different and they work together as a team. So I just think the whole message is just awesome. Little cute girls. And they're cute. And they're feisty. It's awesome. And the the show itself is um, not just you know funny and great, but it, it's very artistic. You know, you you worked with a 
obviously other great voice actors like uh, Tara Strong and, and Tom Kane. Like, is there somebody that you've collaborated with in your career that you're like, that was a great memory. I, I love that. And then, and then is there somebody you're actually hoping to work with in the future? I mean, the really cool thing about an animation is you'll, you'll show up at a voiceover session and you'll work with, like, um, um, Phyllis Diller, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, Phyllis awesome. Diller. We were just talking about um, Star Wars. Um, oh, Mark. Mark, Mark Hamill. Like, you'll, you'll walk in into a session and there will be, like, legendary um, people. Like, Phyllis Diller was like, ha, ha! <laughs> crazy, but I liked her. Yeah. And she was probably 90 then and, you know, just amazingly talented. And so you never know with voiceover, but that's what's so cool about it is it doesn't have anything to do with your body or your age or your face or your hair or your color or your race or your religion or your sex. And, you know, I play a boy, I play a girl, I play an old lady, I play a teenager. You know, I love the, I love where, you know, I love the people that come in and do animation, and I love the people that I get to be in animation. And um, speaking of just the differences between voice acting and, you know, on camera acting, are there some challenges or, or things that you consider, like, fun f more from, like, one or the other? Yeah, I think what's cool about on camera is I, I'm a character actress, so I like to really, like transform my body and I get a lot of roles where I get to change like sex head in um 31 did any of you guys see that um horror I do fans. a lot of horror fans in here what's wrong with you guys <laughs> no, I'm just kidding um yeah, you work with Rob Zombie in yeah, a couple with of Rob movies Zombie right with 31 and, and Devil's, Devil's Rejects, Rejects yeah. yeah well usually Rob the good thing about Rob Zombie is um he knows like he casts very specifically and he usually knows exactly how he wants to wardrobe you before you show up on the set like he knows my size and my body so he always puts me in very particular so for me I really love transforming physically for on camera and um you know Dottie was kind of quirky and you know she was quirky and um and then and then I love um the beauty of bad animation is that that it has nothing to do with your body and you know it has nothing so you're so much even more freer because you could be an inanimate object. You could be a, um, a talking uh, puppy or a ball, or you could be a talking that, whatever this thing were, is. You were Sherry in Pee Wee's Playhouse, right, too? Um, or, or, no, I wasn't. Oh, actually. you weren't? Okay, no, okay. I didn't do the Pee Wee's Playhouse. I just did Pee Wee's Big just Adventure. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so the difference is just um, they're both amazing. One, I get to transform myself and my body, the other, I get to transform use my voice to transform myself anywhere, you know? And sometimes I really like being like on a set where I get to be all dressed differently and change myself up. Or sometimes I like being in my pajamas in a recording studio and then I can do whatever I want to. <laughs> and uh, you are not just an actress, uh, you're a musician as well. Yeah, I'm a musician. And um, for uh, 80s fans especially, you were part of a lot of soundtracks. You did like yeah. Better Off Dead, uh, The Breakfast Club, Scarface. Like there's so many things in your resume. You know, what, what, what was that like? Did you write those songs? You know, what was that experience like? Um, some of those songs, uh, some of the songs I wrote and some of those songs, they, I would be in a studio working on a Thief of, uh, some soundtrack for some movie and then some you know huge producer on some other big movie would walk in the studio and he'd be like who's singing that song that's a, you know who's singing that and I'd be like it's me and then they'd be like oh can you can you write and uh, co-write with uh, Harold Fultemeyer the guy who did that dun 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 dun, dun Axel F theme song so they'd be like can you work on a song for our soundtrack so then the next thing you know I'd be writing and singing the theme song for a Thief of Hearts and then you know that was just a weird thing I mean that's just my thing is I I love music and I love writing music and music is like really run my life. Like I just feel like it, it changes my, it just rocks my world. Music rocks my world. Like it change it's the, it changes everything. Like you, I could be talking to you right now and playing one kind of music and then I see you one way playing another kind of music. I see you another way. So to me, it was always my deep, deep passion is to do music. And I don't know. I just started, um, whenever I did a movie, I'd be like, Oh, I think I have a song for this movie. Uh, you know, for Rugrats, I'd be like, I have this song, it's called Changing Faces. And the next thing you know, I'd get it in that movie. Or just music just started to, it, it all just sort of fall on top of each other. Music and then a movie and then an acting and then a voice thing. And, you know, which I like. I never get bored. <laughs> but apparently. And then I'm a and mom. You, and apparently too, which, you do it all too. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> do. I think I'd be bored if I didn't keep changing it up. 
Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, speaking of music, you yeah. recently wrote a song and also made a music video for this uh, song called So Pretty. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about what you're kind of, I'm kind of hearing is called the So Pretty Movement. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it basically, correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of talks about how it's great to want to look good on the outside, but it's more important to look within and, and be beautiful inside and kind. And can you talk about that? Yeah, so the So Pretty movement came because I'm a mom of two really beautiful millennial young women. And and um, and I guess because my career was always based on, you know, luckily I got into voiceover, so I had some relief from it. But my whole career was based on how I looked and my size and my weight and my face and my skin. You know, it was there was so much importance on the outside that I suffered a lot. I mean, I went through all those phases of like eating disorders and you know, really battled, like I wanted to be good on the outside all the time. And then what happens is I become a mother and then I have to be responsible for my kids. So my girls are like typical girls and they'll be like, do I look fat? Do I look fat? Do I look fat? And it's like, oh my God, because I did that, but I had to change it. I had to change it up and not, and my practice was not to say anything about their body and to say, how do you feel? You know, how are you feeling? And they'd be like, I don't know, but do I look fat? And I'm like, no, how do you feel? And my daughter would start crying and say, I feel sad. You know, and so I think what happened is the So Pretty song came about as I was writing a bunch of songs for some new things. And I wrote with these two new writers, um, Elliot and Elijah. And this song came out and it and it was called So Pretty. And it was all about that thing. And I was like, I felt like it was so channeled because the song happened in like, we wrote it from top to bottom in like 30 minutes. Lyrics, everything it was done. And when we got done writing it, I left the session that day and I was like, I have to release that song. And they were like, well, we were going to submit it for this other artist. And I was like, I have to release that song because it matters so much to me. And the song was about, you know, especially now there's the Kardashians and they're beautiful and they, they do a lot in the realm of like fashion and they're very fashion forward and you learn a lot, but there's also a lot of things. There's a lot of augmentation that goes on and that's dangerous. And I actually have friends that have done things that are so dangerous to their bodies and their faces that, um, you know, there's a one woman in the video that you'll see the video. I won't tell you who she is, but there's one woman that almost lost her life because she had her boobs done so many times and her body lipoed so many times that she ended up getting staph. And then they had to put like a pick line into her heart so the staff wouldn't go to her brain. I mean, it's really scary stuff. But to me, I thought it was really important to make sure that you know, if somebody's feeling that, if you're feeling like you have to do that much stuff on your outsides, well, then you better do that much stuff on your insides to fill yourself up because somewhere there's a hole leaking. And that means like, if you're, if you're, I know for myself too, like I'm really like, oh my God, I'm getting so wrinkly. Oh my God, my neck is dropping. Oh my God. Oh my God. And it's like, then I say, what's really going on here? Like, where am I feeling empty? Where am I not getting the attention I need or the love that I need? So I really, that's what So Pretty is all about. It's all about going deeper, you know, fixing the outsides is a bottomless pit for men and women. You know, it's a bottomless pit. You can work on yourself like crazy, but the work has to start from the inside and you have to love yourself on the inside. And you have to ask yourself, do I like myself? Am I being a kind person? Am I being an evolving person? And so that's what the So Pretty movement is about. And this song is basically that. And there's a lot of versions I've been releasing, like on Instagram, some B-track versions, short clips of the, where I, I did some even funny versions and some campy versions of the same message. So check those out as well. But this is the So Pretty video. Do you, did That's you want super it? cool. That, no, I saw it. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, and, and uh, we'll watch it here before audience questions. So, so thank you for doing something like that. That's very important and very cool. Um, and you also uh, are very much involved in animal activism. So, yes. so I want to talk about that because animals are awesome. Um, and so uh, do you have uh, any organizations that um, you think people should be aware of or support or, or how, how can people help? Well, there's a million. And that's why I like, I like, to, I like to use my voice for, <clears throat> that's one of the biggest places I like to use my voice other than animation, but to speak for the, speak, the ones that can't speak. So um, there's like Last Chance for Animals. They do the most incredible animal activism work you will ever see. I mean... Krista Rose, who runs it, has been shot saving animals from cruel and horrible animal abuse um, all over the world in different spectrums of animal abuse. So that's one of the main ones that I do a lot of work for. But And there's also smaller ones like Toby's Small Dog Rescue. If you go to Instagram, look up Toby's Small Dog Rescue. And that just happens to be a woman I met who just has this huge heart and goes to, to um, shelters and rescues 
a lot of little dogs that um, the owners just didn't take care of and they were dying of something or they were suffering from something and they basically just say, we don't want it anymore. And the dogs are like in the pound, like, where's my family? You know, they're so sad and it's so sad to me that, but this one woman, um, T from Toby Small Dog Rescue goes and pulls them from these shelters and they're a mess. And then what I do is I foster some of these, a lot of these little dogs I bring home. And some of them are so, like one was thrown out of a car window, a moving car window, tiny dog on its head. And somebody saw it and thought the dog was dead and then rescued it. And then the dog was like falling over for a while because it had head trauma. And then I take that dog and I just hold it on my chest and love it until it feel safe again. And it takes them a long time sometimes, but so there's so many things. There's so many things you could do little or small for animals. Yeah. Oh, that was so great. So I wanted to play a little game. Okay. I like games. Um, because you're very talented. So, um, I wanted to come up with some questions that you could answer in your legendary voices. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Um, so. I'm going to take this off. Okay. <laughs> I'm nervous a little bit. No. Okay. What are some of your favorite movies? Um, let me see here. Um, I really like Babe, even though I'm not doing Babe's voice right now. And I don't just like it because I did the voice of Babe. <clears throat> I also liked um, Happy Feet. As far as on camera, um, I liked... Oh, uh, um, I really like This is 40. You know the movie This is 40? Is that what it's called? Yes. <laughs> Going on 40? Go, or, yeah, I think that's I really like that movie because it was really accurate. <laughs> um, yeah. That was so good. Uh, what do you Google the most? Mm, animal rescue videos. <laughs> <laughs> People think I'm crazy. I'm always like, <laughs> you know, watching these videos crying because they're so remarkable. These dogs are so forgiving. So that's my main thing. I think I watch animal videos and then I watch um, by autobiographies because I like learning about people's journeys, you know, especially people that have had like, most of the time, if anybody's got a really cool career, they've had some rough times because they're usually, you, you go through life and you have these journeys where you have like all kinds of stuff happen to you and then you're able to be a messenger for such cool stuff. So I like messages and I like learning them and I like teaching them and I like videos with them. Okay, cool. Um, I got another uh, game question for Google you. is the bomb, by the way, right? <laughs> I love Google. <laughs> um, what uh, can you do? Can you answer as Buttercup? What music do you listen to? Well, I really like um, bands like Coldplay. Mm. Um, Adam Levine does some good songs. Okay. Um, let me think here. What's your favorite? My favorite. Yeah. Ooh, that's a lot. Everything from the Beatles to Mozart to Ooh. Billie Eilish, everyone. Yeah. Billie Eilish. Eilish. Yeah. I really like her too. Yeah, she's really cool. You guys, Buttercup she's is really talking cool. to me right now. I'm kind of freaking out. <laughs> Don't freak out. Just calm down. <laughs> in a good way. Freaking out in a good way. I mean, there's really just so many, there's so many different kinds of artists I like. You know, like, um, I actually like Justin Bieber, too. I like some of his songs, too. <laughs> Butter comes into Justin Bieber. <laughs> Even though he's a brat. He's kind of a brat like me. Yeah. <laughs> so, Is he really married? I think so. That's what the Instagram says. Dang it. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, E.G., what would you be doing if you weren't an actress or musician? I think I'd be a veterinarian. Okay. Or a paramedic. Yeah. Trying to help people and I think animals. So. As well. I just have a thing. I just have a thing about healing people. That would be my superpower. If I was a real superhero, superpower, that would be my superpower. I'd want is the power to heal. Healing. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. And then we're going to open the floor to audience questions. So please think of some good ones. Um, I am curious, you know, throughout your experience in entertainment in this industry. Was there either a mistake you made or a really um, challenging event that might, might have occurred to you that you're so glad happened? Um, I mean, there were a couple of those times in my career where I felt like I made a bad decision, where like I turned down something mm -hmm. that I, uh, once I turned it down afterward, I was like, oh my God, well, what did I do that for, you know? And I battled myself for years on certain decisions. Like if I had made this better decision, then I would have been there probably. But I really think that everything really does happen 
the way it's supposed to. And I, um, I think because I've really applied myself to learning that everything happens for a reason, like everything. Um, um, and then there were there was a time where I went through like um, a lot of anxiety. I had like a midlife crisis of like severe anxiety, and I didn't know what that was. I was like, what is anxiety? Like, I thought I was, something was really wrong. I was like, I'm, can I say fucked up? I thought I was fucked up. I was like, I'm not, am I ever going to be normal? I literally was like, what is happening to my body? And then I, th at the moment, I was just like, I don't know how people survive feeling that kind of anxiety in their body. And I, I did a lot of learning about it. I, I studied a lot and I, I, I went in and I, and it was a scary time. You know, people are like, what's wrong with you? You're not yourself. And I'm like, I'm not myself. I don't know who this person is, but it's not me. You know, and then that time period actually um, forced me to do the kind of work that changed my life and, and the kind of work that made me have so much more compassion for everybody that is going through any kind of thing. And the part, the time, the kind of work that made me have a lot more humility and more gratitude for everything. So I would say... That's a really great question. And I think that, you know, if, if people are going through a dark time, that's a really incredible time. And know that around the bend is some magic. And I think when you're feeling that dark, it just means that you have to, um, when you're in a real darkness, it forces you to do take certain steps to find back to a lit up path again. And, and that just is, um, it means you're going to do a little more work. And it's pretty incredible what happens on the other side of that. So I would say, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Next question. Yeah. Uh, did you say that the when you auditioned for Tommy Pickles that it was claymation? Did I hear you correctly? Yeah. They actually showed me a claymation of Tommy Pickles when I first auditioned for it. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. So so Rugrats, when, like in the pilot, was it, it, it was claymation? Or like, how did they make that transition? That's no, they just, I think they actually, they did a claymation for the, for the animators so they could see the real full spectrum of the character. But to be honest about Tommy Pickles was I actually wasn't the first Tommy Pickles. I don't know if anybody knows that, but they actually had cast someone else. They had done a whole season worth of the, the show before they aired it, and then they, I guess, wanted to change the voice. So I came in um, afterward and re had to redub all of the card all of the episodes they had done. So, But I think the claymation was just a um, way to show what the character looked in three, in, you know, in, your, in the palm of your hand. Cool. And not just a two-dimensional or, you know. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Oh, over here. I get so nervous when you throw that thing. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, is there any voice that you've done that you found especially difficult to do or to, you know, keep up? Yes. Um, one was um, the voice of, you know, the live action, um, the Little Rascals feature. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so they did the live action, and then the boy that did that voice, they needed it to be scratchier. So he was like, what the high side, pretty? You know, they wanted like this, and I was just like, okay, here goes, which was really ripping, you know, for your throat. But it was only little little batches of Froggy in that movie, but I did that, and that was that was um, a tough voice to do. And also there was a movie called Lorenzo's Oil that was, I think, Susan Sarandon and... Um, Nick Noll, Susan Sarandon, I can't remember the other actor, but it was a really cool movie about a boy, a live action, about a boy who was um, ill, and um, and then as he started to deteriorate, he couldn't do the acting he required because he was so little, so then they brought me in, which happened to be the same director I did Babe, Babe 1 and Babe 2 and Happy Feet for, George Miller, who did all the Mad Max movies, and so they brought me in on that. That was the first one I worked on with George Miller, and that movie... They had to lie me in a giant soundstage. And there was a giant screen back here. And they lied me on the ground and they mic'd, They put a mic over me while I lied down. And the director would be on his knees and be like pressing on my ribs and my chest. So, Or he'd, I'd be standing in front of him and he'd be like squeezing my ribs like that. And that was tough too. So I'd have to be like, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and that is how fancy and sexy you can be. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank going you. off of that question, actually, yeah. did you have you ever actually like lost your voice just from working? Um, I have a really strong voice, I think, from doing okay. so much singing. And uh, but there there were times where it's pretty rare. Okay. I mean, I usually can talk right through the 
I can push myself right through it. So let's say I'm here and I actually am getting over a little cold, but, and then if I need to go right here, I just kind of push it over it. I sort of push it right over the cold or, you know, um, it voices are, you push, you put sort of energy behind it so that I'm able to like, if I want to talk like an old lady who says, honey, why don't you come over sometime? You know, I just kind of push past the voice a little bit into another place. There's been a few times where I had like a, um, some kind of cold rare. It's very rare that I can't push past it where I lost my voice and I feel like I had to push the session on back. But yeah, not that often. That's awesome. Yeah. I just love how you can just transition immediately into any voices. It's very, very incredible. It's fun, <laughs> it's fun especially when there are telemarketers calling you. <laughs> it really is. And then you're like, um, my mom's not here right now. Can she call you later? Can we have your number? I will call you at your dinner time too. And they're like, ooh, ah. Can I hire you to do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, next question. Oh, back there. All righty. Another Rugrats question. Yeah. You spoke fondly of the show because it was a lot of it was about family and everyone can relate to it. Um, so it was funny and fun to watch, but like a lot of good shows, there's so much more to it. There's a lot of lessons, um, especially for kid viewers. Yeah. So it was about friendship, forgiveness. Um, you know, disappointment, everything. Was there any episode or moment in the show that you remember being particularly proud of? Um, I think overall with Rugrats, I loved them. I mean, I learned a lot from Rugrats. I loved them teaching us about, you know, when they did like the Passover episodes and the different relig religious um, holidays and really embracing all of that. And I think it was in, in general... I just loved that they brought up all kinds of subject matters, single parenting and the feelings that a child goes through where th they only have one parent and the loss of that. And I just, for me, I just really liked where they got a little deep. <laughs> I kind of like deep, I like deep sometimes. But um, I, I think those are the ones. I mean, particularly like it's, it's if I were to really look at episodes, I really love the naked episode where Tommy Lewis talks about being, I like being naked, you know. I mean, who doesn't like being naked? And just, you know, the the feelings of just that, you know, I think I really like that episode. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Over there. So I want to start off by saying thank you for being one of the voices of my childhood. Yeah, you're welcome. I very much appreciate it. Um, but I have a question about your creative process. So when you are trying to uh, voice a character, like a human character, you say you can match uh, someone's mouth with the voice they should be making. Uh, but when someone says, OK, we brought you here to be the voice of this talking bridge, um, what goes through your mind to say, this is exactly how this bridge is supposed to sound? Um, that's a great question. Um, well, I would look at the bridge, and I would see, is it a girthy bridge? Is it a stone bridge? Is it um, um, is it rickety? I mean, I would literally just look at all those things. So if it was a girthy bridge, I would bring in some depth. You know, if it's um, if it's an old bridge, I might bring in a little older bridge. You know, I I literally would just look at um, the materials at the bridges, and then, you know, and then just base it on that. You know, it's it really you can really. You know what I mean? You can really, um, it works. I don't know how it works, but it works. And usually the first voice that comes out of my mouth is usually the right one. Sometimes they might say, okay, now do that voice. But like for Rugrats, when they did Rugrats and then they did All Growed Up, you know, it was Tommy Pickles talks right here. And then they'd say, now we're going to do Tommy Pickles all grown up a little bit older. So then you just have to imagine like dialing it up on a radio, like Tommy Pickles talks like this. And then they want him to be a little bit older. So then I keep his voice a little cracky, but he's sort of like a teen boy. You know what I mean? Wow. So there, that's how you do it. It's weird, but it works. Thank you. <laughs> so You're good. welcome. <laughs> so good. And going off of his question too, I wanted to ask for just on camera acting, um, assuming you use some of the same uh, voice skills uh, that you developed, uh, because you know if you have like uh, Candy from Devil's Rejects, uh, uh, oppo as opposed to like a uh, Dottie from Pee Wee, right? Like they they were all very different voices. And and is that is there some is do you use the same techniques as well? Um, kind of, yeah, a little bit like Rob Zombie on Thirty One, which is the most r the recent where I have the blue hair, but. You know, he actually said to me, I want to do something different with this character's voice. And I really love that because 
normally directors don't do that, but Rob's a singer, you know? And so I really love, um, um, I love that I got to make this character a little bit like a cartoon come to life. Like she was wearing blue and I had these little bloomers on and, you know, my wardrobe came on a hanger with like clip to the hanger was a little plastic baggie and in the plastic baggie was two pieces of mask of duct tape, like two little X's of duct tape and then a little, um, so crazy. Anyway, um, Anyway, everything about that character was, she was little and she was feisty, but she was not like, um, I don't know. There was just something about that. And he said, I want you to have um, a particular kind of voice. And I just thought, this is, a, this is a great opportunity for me to merge what I do. And, and that's why Sex Head was, um, see you later, Popeye. I'm going to go get me some spinach, you know. I don't talk like, I don't talk as sweet as that, but she did. <laughs> You just, I mean, you really look like a, you, it felt like I was watching a comic book. Yeah, I love, yeah, that was so, so cool. Fun. I'd like to do more movies like that where I get to be a comic book character come to life because it's so limitless, like what you can do with your, with wardrobe and makeup and hair and, you know, it's incredible. And then change your voice up. Right. I'd like to be like a small little gremlin thing, you know, where <laughs> I'm just like, I don't really like. That big, you know, so it's oh. just so it's literally Gremlins three. Maybe they should get you on there, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> EG, where can people find you? Um, you guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at real EG daily because there's some fake ones, so make sure it says real before my name, EG daily, like daily news. And then I'm also on Facebook, I have a fan Facebook and a regular, so try to find those. And then um, I also have egdaily.com where it has everything on there. I mean, you can get all my my handles on there, the correct ones. And it. I think my Instagram feed is on there. So it's all on there. And then my YouTube page has a lot of music videos and things that I put out there on YouTube. So EG Daily on EG Daily's YouTube page. But keeping it real, real EG Daily. That's me. Yeah. Well, thank and I try to answer, like, people will message me and... You know, like if you guys have any questions or you want to, you have a real passion or desire to connect with me, I really try to follow uh, when I feel that from people to make myself accessible because I think it's, I've met some of the most incredible people that, that connect. My, one of my best friends was a stalker <laughs> and she turned out to be my best friend. She literally followed me at these wow. concerts I was doing and she scared me at first and she would be like, I took all these pictures of you and here's a book. And I was like, oh my God, she's a stalker. But then over time... It wasn't me, you guys. <laughs> wasn't you. I was wondering if that was... No. She was Spanish. No, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, uh, um, and she ended up like... Um, she just kept connecting to me and I felt her just incredible connect desire to be connected. And, and over time, she ended up being my assistant my personal assistant and then she became one of my best friends. And I was just her um I was just her maid of honor at her wedding to her wow. girlfriend in Hawaii. It was amazing. What yeah. an incredible story. Incredible. So yeah. I, I try to keep myself open for magical connections with people and you know, you never know. See, so the story is uh be kind, right? That be kind and, <laughs> and follow your desire. If you want to meet someone, make it happen. You know, people like me will allow you to come over and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but, you know, maybe. <laughs> well, thank you so much for such an inspiring career. And thank you for ma for basically, like Matt said, uh, being the, you know, voice of our childhood. Uh, and thank you. thank you for being here. Please I'm really come back. really happy I got to be here. Thank you guys so much.